Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Now, normally on this channel, as you know, I'm the one who's normally providing the tutorials for Fusion 360. But today, we're gonna to be doing something a little bit different because I have brought on a very special guest who's gonna teach us how to model a Fender style neck. Now, this guest only started using Fusion a little over a year ago until he started watching my videos. And since then, he has become one of the most talented designers I have ever met. He is constantly pushing the boundaries and helping others learn how to model along the way. Now, to give you just a very small idea of the type of work that he's capable of, take a look at these. He is constantly prototyping new and interesting ideas, developing workflows for common designs in the industry, mastering really complex and difficult transitions, and you know, sometimes just having a little bit of fun. Now, if you're a member of my Discord server, this man is no secret, but let me introduce the rest of you to Mattia Valente. Well, welcome, Mattia. I know it's late over there in the Netherlands. Uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then let's go ahead and dive into that uh, neck modeling. Okay, uh, my name is Mattia. I'm a doctor by trade and an amateur guitar maker, and I've been building guitars since I was 17, which is... a uh, Let's just say more than 20 years ago is when I started. Been a hot minute. And uh, and then, uh, yeah, I, I picked up on Fusion watching your videos as I was building my CNC machine, which still isn't finished. But in the meantime, I've learned to actually model the things I plan to build with it. How long ago did you start learning Fusion? Um, I think really, really it was around the time that you published your perfect head headstock transition video okay that was like mm. one of the first videos that really kind of clicked with me like oh okay so that's how this workflow works and i downloaded it a few times gotten frustrated trying to like model a radius dish and just because uh, i never really sat down and bothered to learn the basics that's pretty incredible actually just because you've yeah you've <laughs> You are the fastest growing like designer I've ever seen in Fusion. Because like you went from like not being able to model a radius dish to being like way outperforming me in many circumstances on modeling guitars and coming up with like new interesting workflows. And for those of you who don't know, Mattia has helped me a lot on a lot of my videos and previous models that I've done, including like the parametric fretboard. And also like my parametric mare file, like I shared those files with him multiple times and he worked out some of the kinks with me. So to go from that to where you are now in a year and a half is quite a journey. Yeah, it's a lot of just way, way too many evenings and late nights spent <laughs> just hacking at things going like this should work. And I'm, I also don't, I'm not like, oh no, it looks good enough. I'm like, no, nah, it, it looks okay, but. The workflow is messy, so let's go back and, and model it efficiently or cleanly, or let's try it with different with a different workflow, or swap the swap the lofts around and see which one you know which one works best. And that teaches you like how the how the software behaves. And like my main goal is to make the tools like you know set set up your your guide surfaces, set up everything so that make make your sketches so that everything just Works. flows on its own yeah. so you're not forcing so you're not trying to force geometry into something that it mathematically doesn't want to do um well let's go ahead and dive into the neck video so we're going to be talking about how to model a strat neck correct um i mean this is like the thing that if most beginning cnc guitar builders are going to start with a uh, non-angled flat headstock uh guitar neck and i mean you basically end up with uh, the designs that leo fender came up with uh, decades ago what i'm doing here is i'm inserting my uh, parametric fretboard file as a as a starting point i'm breaking the link in this case so that i have full access to all of the uh, um, the parameters it doesn't mean i can't update it but in this case it doesn't really matter so much okay this is just me you know create a new component just good design practice that just keeps your sketches separated all i'm really going to use from the fretboard sketch are the outlines really the outlines and the fret lines but i'm not going to use the, the the fretboard that was generated here i'm I'm creating a number of user parameters so like your net neck the depth of the neck the full depth at the at the nut 
Okay. So you're trying to define like the actual thickness of the neck, like yeah, let's say at the first fret or the 12th fret Total. or front to back, et cetera. Now, what I like about this is that you're defining these variables right at the very, right at the very forego, like the front of your modeling uh, workflow, because yeah. then that way, when you get there, it's already available. Yeah. What I'm doing here is um, basically I'm building the, the, the origin plane that the sketches are on is going to be the fretboard gluing surface. So I'm creating an offset plane that's the thickness of the fretboard plus uh, a tiny amount, usually like 0.2 millimeters. So I just get I just want the the body of the neck to slightly overlap the the thing I'm gonna the the cutting tool the cutting lock I see. for the so you're actually fretboard surface you're actually intersecting I'm overbuilding those two a little yeah okay I thought it was the other yeah. way I thought you left a gap and I was like that that's interesting no no I'm making it bigger I got you yeah. So basically, I want the I'm, I'm setting up the planes the the, the the plane for the top of the uh, top of the fretboard and for the bottom of the heel, which is also the bottom of the bottom of the, the headstock on a fender style neck. But I find it's actually easier to just project in the corners and then connect the dots. They're less it, likely to get screwed you know, up. It, there's less less weird purple geometry, and it means yeah. that you have uh, in this case they're just full length rails so i don't need to select multiple pieces mm -hmm. for before for, for a surface patch for example and for the for the fretboard outline there's a reason that there are multiple little line segments because of how that file set up so let me pause it real quick why do you have this is just something i noticed and there's nothing wrong with this why do you place your origin point up closer to the nut rather than further back because i typically place it most closer to the guitar body so like the central axis is more centered in the guitar. Uh, for me, basically it's, uh, that's how I started because it just made sense to me that like the origin for my model is the origin for my, uh, the origin for my strings, which is the midpoint of the nut, like Got zero it. fret. Yeah. That's where I start from. Scale it does zero. Mean that, um, it's, yeah. yeah. Scale zero is zero. Uh, yeah. It does mean that, uh, that it's a little fussier if you're working on the body because the origin plane's like living on top of your, up top of your screen. So it's just useful to have everything dimensioned off of that, off of that point. Yeah. Up it, it, there's, the it doesn't really matter. I just know that my zero is my not line. Yeah. That's how I I've can, always I can see how that's guitars helpful. on paper. That's, that's how I've always designed guitars on paper. So that's how it ends gotcha. up working. I mean, if you, if you look at the files I have for just uh, like a guitar body, then the origins usually at the tail just because that's kind of a fixed point on the yep. guitar body. OG style neck modeling. You put the neck profile at the, um, like an yeah, inch down, first fret. like yeah. somewhere around first fret or a little before, a little past that. Um, the way I'm approaching it in this model is that I'm putting it one at 12th because the, the heel has different geometry. So you want to stay a little, you want some bit distance between that, that. And, and yeah. yeah, and in this case, just uh, at at the zero, so where the fretboard ends, and I've projected intersected in the edges of the fretboard, and I'm doing a well a U style. This is a really fussy sketch to uh, constrain fully, mm -hmm. because Fusion is really inconsistent about it. Sometimes you're like, you know, this this isn't constrained. Why can't I constrain it? Then you just delete something and do it in a different order, and it actually works. So it's very odd. Yeah. So the the, the angle thing I do is uh, like on my own neck. Uh, my personal preference is for a, for a Van Halen Music Man ish asymmetry. How does it go uh, in opposite that, directions? Um, no, it just means that the the bit under your thumb is a bit thicker. Mm. And it's a little flatter by the at the, at the treble end, Got it. and I can just achieve that by by going off the uh, off angle by uh, five degrees or so. So we're just setting up. Is this isn't the nut yeah. side, right? This is the heel this side. This is the twelfth fret. You know, everything is black. Yeah, that looks good. Need to, yeah. The one thing that I do um, that I've been doing lately is just right clicking on sketches and displaying the dimensions. Mm. that lets you tweak things and you can't like dimension stuff but you can edit values that are entered without entering the sketch huh 
which is actually quite useful. Kind of a matter of principle thing. It's just, you know, good design hygiene to just use parameters for stuff that you know may be adjustable. Because I feel like you, if you're just, even if you're just goofing around, but it's something really works and you're like, oh no, that's actually really nice, then you at least mm -hmm. you've got the basics lined up. If you have no idea what you're doing, just, you know, Let's don't constrain it. stuff and just sketch until you have a vague idea of what you're working on. But as soon as you start lofting things together, constrain your sketches. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's actually, that's really, really important because so many things can go wrong later in the timeline if you don't have constrained sketches. And that's Even if you just lock everything down. Yeah. You know, for, for like things that are more mostly decorative. I'm going to pause it here because I, I want to dwell on that point for a second because there's now, obviously if you go to design school, they're going to tell you like d d constrain your sketches or you're going to fail the class, but there's a very good reason for that because having defined geometry sets the rules for all of the other tools. And the number one thing I see when people send me or ask me questions or send me, you know, asking me how to do something and then they send me a screenshot. It's almost always lots of blue lines, lots of unconstrained splines, unconstrained lines. And they're wondering why yeah, things and, aren't working. And somewhere like in the fourth uh, object, a little yellow warning, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. You're like, yeah, yeah no, broken you, timelines. You, and <clears throat> if yeah. you're going to, if you're not going to direct model, then you really do need to fix the stuff that's telling you it's broken. It's, it really stabilizes the timeline, which ends up yeah. stabilizing your model. Because uh, if Fusion doesn't know what to do with those lines or arcs or whatever, well, they're free yeah. to move and that can break your timeline. So anyway, this is the uh, the headstock sketch, which is one of the main uh, important things. What I found actually is to get the, re the reason I'm not going around the corner, like on a fender headstock is I found that the loft uh, or patches are a lot neater if you just make it a sharp corner and do a G2 fillet at the end or even a tangent fillet. Because so I think the, the on the fender headstock, it's actually an arc. But yeah, I, I do the sweepy bits with splines because they they can move. It's not necessary in this particular use case because I'm, I'm not building this model to be parametric. But if you do want something that can move a little more easily with uh, even adjustments in nut width because I mean all, all you really care about is like you know you have to decide is do I want the width of my headstock to be uh, based on you know off the center line or off of the edge of the fretboard or how do I want to do that and in this case I'm doing it off of the edge of the uh, off of the corner of the, of the fretboard there well you, well, you bring, you bring um, up a what good I've, point because the generally when you're modeling, if you if you know that there's going to be a radius there later, you typically want to mark to model it as a sharp corner and apply a fillet feature. Yeah. But you can do sketch fillets as well um, once you've modeled everything else, but they can be pretty yeah. finicky. And so typically when I'm doing something like this, I will do exactly the same thing. I'll model it as a sharp corner, knowing that later I'll add I'll add that radius to it. Yeah, this is like the world's ugliest headstock, but I'm just basically doing something vaguely Fender-ish. I wouldn't yeah, say it's the world's, it, world's ugliest. I've seen I've seen much worse. Yeah, but it's it's not good though. But the, yeah. honestly, like I generally spend more time on the headstock than I did on this entire video. It's it's actually it's really hard thing. to get a good looking and interesting and new headstock design, <laughs> like one that people haven't done before. I spent an ungodly amount of time doing that myself but that does bring up a good point like i tend to spend most of my time doing the sketches like getting those sketches rock solid nailing them down yeah. and then if i do those well everything else kind of falls into place but and usually I, when there's something wrong with the geometry it's not like adjusting loft inputs it's going back to the sketches and changing mm -hmm. them moving like moving a moving a plane or you know, increasing the size or, of your or if something breaks in your timeline it's usually a sketch feature that's broken at some point yeah usually it's yeah. the lost projection yeah 
because you moved something and then it couldn't figure out what the hell you meant. Yeah. Okay, this the this is just I the sketch line, which is going to basically the length of my uh, where I want my tuners to live, the tuner holes, because I only do one hole and then pattern it along the path. You're you're ahead of ahead of me on that one. I only started doing that recently with the parametric video. Otherwise, I just always drew all separate holes. Yeah. Okay, so right here. Yeah, this ba basically like two or three I get the, I get points. this I just put the control points on the control point uh handles that are already there. Mm. That are locked down. So they're already locked. So those bits of geometry are locked and they're also already curvature continuous to the and other that way you don't have to having to actually them. apply I don't have to constrain them. They're already constrained. I just need to <laughs> fuss with the ones at the bottom here until it gives me a shape that I like. That's actually really smart because then basically what you're doing is you're using the existing curvature because you defined yeah. the headstock with using control point splines. You can use that existing control point spline curvature to guide yeah. your the loop. Yeah. Without having to constrain That's the idea. Thing. Without That's having to do extra, without having unnecessary because headstock sketches are actually like a little too complex for what Fusion likes, to be mm -hmm. honest. Especially because I'm doing the volume in the sketch, I could do it in a separate one. Or it's just a lot of splines, lines that are all very that all need to actually behave when I'm doing it. When I'm designing something that can do multi-scale, so it all needs to be like you know, it, it's fussy. And I, I found that the to... more the more dimensions and constraints you add, the more likely the sketch is to break over time. Yeah, and. Um, yeah, like the bigger and the honestly, sketch it's, is, the more unstable it is. Okay, so this is the your basic sketch done. So all you've got so far is, is two profiles, a headstock outline, the basic outline of the, the face. So we've got most of the front-facing geometry that yeah. we need to deal with. We, we don't have yeah. the heel um, or the side profile yet. Now, I can't believe you do all of this with a trackpad. But yeah. <laughs> That seems nutty to me, but I'm actually thoroughly impressed. <laughs> so now I'm sketching on the bottom of the neck. I'm projecting in what the back of the headstock needs to be. So the the outline of the um, the outline of the headstock and the volute. So not the swoopy bits that connect to the fretboard edge and the edges of the fretboard as construction geometry. Because now I'm going to draw the heel shape. So maybe I missed it. Case, Why I'm... did you need to project in the headstock when you're drawing the heel sketch? Because it's on the same plane as the heel. So... Oh, I see. I see. Because you're going to, since they're at the same plane, you can just do that sketch yeah. now. I can do two separate yeah. sketches, but it's, you know, it's two very simple outlines. So why not? Um, this is just a basic Telecaster style heel, which is uh, two arcs, quarter inch radius, so 6.35 millimeters. Um, what I also find is important to get a clean heel transition is to make sure the edges of here of, of this bit are, are are tangent to the to the edges of the neck. You can do it when it's not. So, like what you get if you're uh, trying to model a a guitar neck that flows completely with a that follows a body outline, but it makes the corners pinch a little. I think you might have mentioned this earlier, but why do you prefer to use parallel over collinear? constraints i see you using a lot of parallel I've found, versus collinear um i found collinear i don't know maybe it's just that i was modeling badly <laughs> before and i'm doing it better now but it it um with uh parametrically adjustable stuff it tended to um like if you got a sketch error where it like you know got a comp computation failure it was almost always a collinear so i just got rid of them oh okay i avoid them it's more more stable in your experience. Yeah, but it, I should probably go revisit them and see if it's if it was just me being not sketching very well before. Well, the the way I tend to think about constraints is what do I actually care about, right? Like yeah. I could use a parallel constraint, but I don't actually care that they're parallel. I care that they are straight along the same path, right? Yeah. And so that for me tells me that I should be using a collinear constraint because that's the right design intent. 
Yeah. There's a lot of times where I find myself grabbing like a horizontal vertical constraint. And actually what I want is a tangent or what I actually yeah. want is a horizontal or not a horizontal, a collinear or something, because yeah. that's actually what I care about. Okay. So all the sketches are done except for the transitional bits and the transitional bits need to be uh, uh, done with the neck shaft with the neck shaft already modeled. So I just lofted between two, the, between the two profiles. And this is like the, the full neck profile. So all the way up to the end, the end of the fretboard. To the 12th fret, I think. Actually behind zero all the way to 12th in this case. And I'm patching the back of the headstock and the bottom of the heel. Just, and we can do that in one command. What I find is this works really well. Just select the whole thing instead of using the sketch geometry, but use the actual body because then you won't mm -hmm. get you zero risk of weird things. And I extrude two things a lot. So in this case, I'm extruding to the top of the fretboard plane. Um, this can be done with plane at an angle. What I'm doing now, I'm just doing it in a very fussy way, but I'm, I'm kind of slicing a wedge off of the uh, Oh, you're doing shaft. my trick. Yeah. This was, this I stole from, I think you did in the Raven video. Yep. First, I was like, hey, that's interesting. Let me try that. For me, the advantage of doing this is, again, playing at an angle is one of those things that if you're doing really wild things, for some reason, it likes to freak out. Flip direction. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, like it suddenly it's upside down, and then you're like, why isn't it working? Oh, okay, it flipped itself for reasons. Yeah, I what I actually understand. found is more stable is if you already have your neck profiles defined, you can do a three-point plane between yeah, the, the nut line. Yep. Yeah. That's what that's what I'm setting up here is a three point plane. I spoke too soon. <laughs> I did plane it angle and then, before, but it wasn't parametrically yeah. stable. Oh. Yeah. What did you just use? Trim. Is that trim? Oh, okay. That was trim. Yeah, which is always like also one of those iffy tools because sometimes it, if you're moving things too much and suddenly it's trimming the other part of like the wrong yeah. side of your trim plane. Mm-hmm. But I found that the more I have to delete this. surfaces, the more unstable it's going to become. Okay, this is another one of those. I'm fully defining the spline without using any actual dimensions. Uh, what I've been doing lately to get like more gradual curvature comb, like here I've done like the two horizontal segments, or vertical in this case, that are uh, collinear with the curvature continues with the neck shaft. I'm doing the same thing here, um, R equal, which gives it a fairly gradual transition into it. Some people like a slightly harder, yeah, like a, a slightly sharper transition there. I will typically just make all three of the control point lines equal. So yeah. the, the weight of each control point is roughly equal to each other, the pull yeah. on it. So it's a really smooth transition. I'm, I'm splitting, splitting the... The neck shaft. Okay. Because what I'm doing here is because because of how I've modeled this, the neck shaft is curved all the way up to the top edge and the heel is flat. So I need to loft between those two, making the curvature continuous aligned to get that transition from flat at the heel to curved. So you're including like a section of the fretboard basically. Yeah. By doing um, it this full way. edge of the whole edge of the fretboard. Is yeah. being modeled now. This is the edge of the fretboard. And then that actually conveniently provides you with helper surfaces. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, that's actually, not, that's really nice. That's clever. It's built in and it keeps it like everything is its own. Yeah. And you don't even have to helper. delete the surfaces later either. It's no. just part of the model. Keeps uh, it smart. clean. You're just splitting the neck shaft and the back into the two halves for the, the transitions. Yep. Yeah. Except I need to select the correct plane that would help you know everything has is two halves because in general i mean you can sometimes you can do single lofts or patches but they tend to go wonky and mm -hmm. pull in one of the two directions well and you're also not as clean as doing two well every every point you add to a patch inf influences its curvature exactly even um, if it's symmetrical like the patch doesn't end up because this is a fairly symmetrical surface but it, yeah. As a general rule, if there's symmetry, either mirror it or do it in two halves in fusion. Just guitar shapes are, I don't 
mirror this because I want the um, say I want to adjust the neck profile to be slightly asymmetrical, then two halves are not the same. Okay, this is just standard watch Austin's neck transition videos, all of them. And that will explain what I'm doing here. And those who haven't watched it, essentially what we're doing is we're generating a helper surface, which he just deleted, to allow us to establish curvature for one side. And then we're using that next one that we've generated to establish the matching curvature on the other side, um, because that helps us generate the correct curve, or at least close enough to the correct curvature without having to establish rails that we don't know the correct shape to. Um, it's kind of a cheat, but it works quite marvelously in most circumstances. I'm just stitching this together because it's less annoying that way. And so you can have a quick look at the quality of the surfaces. That's and great. That looks pretty good. Yeah, that's a, almost perfect, except for right at the backside, but that's going to be sanded. Yeah, that's for wood. This is good enough. Yeah. In fact, almost, you don't need class A surfaces on anything you're going to be sanding heavily with no, 120. Because... <laughs> you know. Okay, so it looks like we got the heel done, the shaft done. Yep. Now we got to do the headstock. Yep. We need our final sketch. So you want the top edge of the fretboard. You need that line. I've done a sketch on a, on like the, the mid plane, the side view plane. Oh, that's a line that represents the face of the headstock that's excessively long. And that's the intersected nut line, which is just an arc. Make that tangent radius of about an inch, which is what Fender does. And you can either, I'm setting the headstock thickness by going the total thickness of the neck minus the uh, Headstock thickness, which gives me the uh, offset from the face. You could also project in the the back of a headstock and and actually dimension it, but you know, yeah. tomato, tomato. So what you're setting up for is an intersect intersection curve, looks like, or split yeah, face, except maybe. without have without having just a, in this case, I just split the face. Okay. Or body, because then I don't need to. Then I can just remove the other body, which is more stable than deleting. Basically, if you can avoid using the delete key, if, if you remove the bodies, it's a, it's a more stable parametric. I found that too. Activity uh, for some reason. Yeah. It also was... warns you sometimes if you were deleting stuff like halfway, like warning, this could impact use remove instead. So again, I'm, I'm extruding up to that body. So I click on the body in the, in the tree because this, say part of it would uh, hit like here. I'm like, oh, oops, slightly too much. Profile's too big. So let's do that again. Didn't deselect part of it. If you have a headstock shape where the swoopy bit is um, falls within the bit you're extruding, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, then again, this is two objects, and you can it's you just click on the body in the timeline, and it'll adjust for that Select slight that. variation. Yeah. yeah. Again, like you I mean, you can overbuild and trim it back, but why? There's no reason to in this case. Yeah, the more I've done these, the more I try to avoid deleting surfaces at all costs yeah. if I can. Just yeah, I mean, sometimes you sometimes you have no choice. Because that's just the, the type of geometry you're building is so complex that it's kind of it's yeah over exceeds like the bounds of what you're modeling. So it looks or like we're basically, doing the same. basically every single time you're yeah this is the same thing I did at the heel basically there's no real yeah. difference between the two and the fact this looks hideous is completely irrelevant because the only bit that matters is the bit that's right next to the midline. And sometimes, honestly, just extruding it sideways mm -hmm. works best. Well, dual tangent uh, I find that is works. kind of like G2 anyway. Yeah. I mean, and also that works best um, and works cleanly um, for volutes where the, the peak of the volute is centered well. If it's like a little lopsided or kind of off-center, then this works better. 
I also because find that's the case if it's, a, if it's a symmetrical shape. Yeah. If it's symmetric, then I find that that works. That tends to work a lot better. Yeah. And, you know, and, and depending on um, how it's set up, like this, this angled cut approach is not always the best approach. Sometimes the other would be like doing it the, 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 the traditional way, way uh, works better. Just depends on the geometry you're trying to create. But this is easier. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need to mess with helper surfaces or sweeps or go like, oh, it's not intersecting. No, I've I've almost exclusively started cutting the neck like that. Um yeah. ever since I did that Raven video. Yeah, the the diamond volute neck is the only one where I went back to doing it differently, but that's because I had some I was trying to do some really weird geometry there. Okay, so it looks like we need to stitch everything together now. Yep. Just stitch it all up. So at this if you're point, lucky. Nope, forgot. Okay, now we have to patch the, the oh, face. Oh, the, the front face. Yeah, that's yeah. why it's not all solid yet. And because it's stitched, and, you can just chain it together. Yeah, we since we pre-stitched it, yeah. Yeah. See, that's the only reason I do the extra stitch, because otherwise it's annoying. I'm lazy. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a solid. And so basically what we and have is the entire the neck, including the, whole the fretboard thing. right now. Yep. Okay, now yeah. I'm just doing a loft cut. For the radius? Uh, yeah. Because of how this is shaped, if you have the radius at like the zero line, it's going to leave a tiny little ridge mm. there, which, I'm, which you can see there. Yeah. So I go, okay, no, this is a new body extended up just... A couple millimeters. Just offset the surface. Yeah, just offset. That's just smart. so it fully encloses. I've since adjusted it so that the, the, the profile is just a little further back. And then just cut it. Um, I rewound it 10 seconds because you just split the fretboard and I wanted people to see that. No, I didn't. Yeah, I, I didn't split the fretboard, did I? Oh, uh, I did. You did. I just rewound it. That was quick. Yeah. So this is like the full neck with the radius on it and then just use the origin plane and it's split. You can't really tell right now other than that there are two bodies. So, But once he applies here, appearances, I, it'll be more obvious. Yeah. And here I add the G2 fillet to the corner and get to get like a, a normal looking headstock. I want the holes now. So this is for a standard modern sealed machine is 10 millimeters. Usually I, I do that parametrically. And then just pattern on a path, and you have to pattern a, a feature. feature. So and you can just click feature. on it in the timeline. You can click on the hole, but you can also click on the whole feature in the timeline. And then set the path. And just to the end there. And the six tuning machines. And that will evenly distribute it. Perfect. Yep. And, and now we make it look like something. Yeah. Turn the sketches off because it gets picky. Apparently, I just downloaded. I think I just re-downloaded when I did this. And because I'm picky, I think Fusion always makes maple too dark. Yeah, I think it makes walnut too brown. Yeah, but it makes it look like rosewood, which is what I'm using it for. So yeah, I'm not too complain. I'm not complaining. All right, so it looks like we got the neck model, and we're just going to now yep. check the curvatures a little bit. Do a quick check. See if there's any there's weird... Tiny bit of on. dimpling there. I think what it, if I was fussing around, I'd, change, I'd maybe tweak the shape of the volume and tweak the shape of the, uh, the transition, which is a little too gradual. Make it a little sharper. The little transition looks, sketch between the neck shaft. It looks phenomenal, man. It, it, yeah. You did a really but good it's job. Just, that's basically down to taste. Yeah, like you know, if you, some people like it like this, some people prefer it that way. The surfaces you'll get like this are smooth and clean, and uh, got two profiles, the outline of a fretboard. Uh, the most complicated sketch is the headstock outline. Yeah, and then it's a bunch of like really simple things with a couple of single splines. And um, in general, I try to do all the sketches I can before creating any features. Yeah. If the if necessary, but in this case you 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 do have to model the neck shaft and patch the top the the back of, of the headstock and the back of the heel. 
to that, that, uh, go ahead. get those transitional sketches in there. And that kind of goes back to what I mentioned in my parametric mare video, where the primary things that are driving the geometry is the sketches. Yep. And so having those earlier in the timeline is really important because then, you know, since fusion calculates linearly, um, it's going to solve those first and will help prevent any breakage later down the line. Um, if you're trying to reference, you know, surfaces that you've already created and projecting in those surfaces, like just get your first couple sketches out of the way and that'll save you a bunch of hassle later down the road. Yeah. Because, I mean, and also keep your sketches simple, make a few, make a couple extra sketches that are simpler. Like if you're, if your headstock sketches is, is screwing you over with a volume just do the headstock sketch and make a separate separate sketch for the volume just project in the lines you need for it yeah it doesn't have to be the same to connect sketch. yeah no because it, yeah. It, it, that just especially when you're still kind of getting to grips with what the hell all the constraints are for because in the beginning you're just like the constraints are to make the sketch black it's like yeah no not quite yeah that's the, that's the effect but that's not what they're for well hey man uh I don't want to keep you up too late. I know it's really late over there. So uh, I just want to say thank you for joining us today and giving us a run through on that neck file. Um, I also want to thank you personally for helping me with a bunch of projects over the years. And You're very uh, welcome. And thank being, you for being such an active member on our discord and you've helped a lot of people. So thank you. Yeah, man. Yeah, you felt, uh, I mean, it would, not, none of it would have been possible without your uh, videos too. And kick me in the gear. I think it would <laughs> probably still be, you know, trying to maul a radius dish. Well, I can also confidently say that the same for you. Some of my projects wouldn't yeah. have gotten off the ground without your help. So thank you, man. You might might be a good idea to mention the uh, they can download the multi head. Yeah. No, if um, I, I shared a, a similar file to this one with a similar workflow uh, on the Discord, like the whole thing's there with all the sketches, etc., with a it has a few extra tweaks, including a, a spreadsheet with uh, some values you can type into the parameter fields for a couple predefined uh, neck profiles. And what I found was with, uh, you know, hacking fusion and using groups and suppressing groups of features, um, I ended up giving, I think it's like 12 or 13 different headstock options where you can just right click and select the right the headstock you want. I'm just saying, join the Discord. There are a bunch of nice files there. And there's a lot bunch. of nice, there's a lot of nice people too. Yeah. It's a, it's a cool place. Mostly to be. It's, it's a, people, it's a but nice place on the like, internet. Yeah. It's a friendly place. Yeah. And very, very helpful people with people like Patia. So, um, thanks again, for, thanks again for coming, man. I really appreciate it. And, uh, we'll see what you do next. Yeah. Let's call it a night. All right. Cheers. Okay. Bye.